As you turn there this evening, I want to thank you for your uh, faithful attendance. Thank you for your hospitality. Uh, we have sure, our sure enjoyed ourselves. We have appreciated your, your graciousness and your hospitality here at the church. Pastor, thank you for the opportunity and the uh, wonderful uh, blessing you and Sarah and the family have been. And uh, we look forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do in the days ahead here uh, at this church. And uh, we're excited about what the Lord's going to do in Big Bear. But until then, we want to be faithful as we travel uh, the country until the Lord call, gets us there uh, with ourselves fully supported. And uh, we're excited about that day and uh, pray that it'll be very soon. So we appreciate your prayers as we do lots of traveling. This next month we'll be all over the place. We'll be headed back to our home area uh, this week. Uh, for this weekend we'll be back in eastern North Carolina. Then we'll head up to uh, Virginia, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Alabama uh, by November. Uh, about the second week or so. So thankfully there's only about four or five hours in between each of those trips and so we'll be able to do those in a day but we'd appreciate your prayers for uh, traveling safety uh, as we're on the road but also that we'd be a blessing and encouragement to each of the churches that we go to uh, as we travel. So thankful the Lord uh, has called us to do that and we're excited about the days ahead and so we pray that uh, the Lord will use this week uh, in each of your lives to be a help and encouragement to you and uh, so as we look at the message tonight, I want to leave you with uh, something hopefully that's encouraging. Uh, once you understand the title of the message and where we're going to go tonight, I believe you'll see that. At first glance, you're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and think, what are you about to preach, Brother Jackie? Well, I can tell you, uh, it's a good thing. I'm not dealing with carnal stuff tonight. I believe all of you love the Lord, and uh, we'll, uh, we're going to hone in really on something else uh, here this evening. We're going to start in verse number 4. Uh, because that kind of gives us the setting uh, of what we are going to talk about tonight. And then uh, we'll read that passage starting in verse number 4. Uh, we'll read through verse 15, and then I'll give you the title of the message and pray. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, starting in verse number 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, yet are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Uh, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Tonight I want to preach a message entitled this, Victory is Sure. So we must finish. Father, help us as we think about this uh, passage of Scripture. And Lord, help me as I preach through it, that it be a blessing and encouragement to each one here tonight. Lord, as believers, help us uh, to understand and know, and maybe even just be reminded tonight that the victory is sure, that we are on the winning side. Lord, tonight uh, we stand uh, knowing that uh, you will have victory in the end. And so we are excited about that and thankful for that, because one day we'll spend eternity with you in heaven. And, uh, and uh, we'll not have to worry about all the things that sin has destroyed and brought about bad, uh, and terrible things in our lives or this world. And so we look forward to that day. But until then, Lord, help us to finish. Help us to finish strong. Help us to finish uh, being faithful to you and doing our work uh, that you have called us to do. Lord, if there's anybody here or online listening tonight or some other time that is unsaved, would you please help them uh, to understand the truth and the simplicity of your gospel message that says they simply must believe on your Son, Jesus Christ, and they shall be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that they would understand the gospel message in that they're sinners uh, bound for hell, but you have paid the price and uh, you have given the free gift of, of salvation to them if they would just simply accept it. And so, Lord, pray that you would help them to be saved. For it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. So tonight, as we think about this idea of the, that victory is sure, 
Uh, so we must finish. I want to kind of go through a few things in uh, introduction tonight that, you know, many people throughout history have tried to fix the outcome of a game. People have been brought up on criminal charges for paying players to throw a game. They, they obviously wanted to ensure that their team would have the victory, and their desire for, was really for one reason. It was probably most likely money. Uh, it may have been uh, for fame and notoriety as well, but people even uh, nowadays try to take drugs that will give them the edge over another athlete. In fact, that's been happening for really probably decades at this point and further, but the, you could ask, why do they do this? Well, simply put, as I just mentioned, they, they would do it for fame and fortune, and many Many have succeeded, but only to be found out later on. And I think of examples like Lance Armstrong, who won seven consecutive Tour de France races. Races. I mean, it was it was unheard of that somebody would win two in a row, really. But this man won seven in a row. And what happened? Uh, he eventually was found out that he was using performance-enhancing drugs. And so, uh, what good were the wins? Nothing. I think of uh, uh, one of the most famous pitchers of all time. Uh, I, there's a number that would that would go to this, but I think of the great pitcher Roger. Clinton. Clemens. Listen to his statistics. He had 354 wins and 184 losses. That is a phenomenal pitching record. He won seven Cy Young Awards. He struck out 4,672 batters, but listen, he only allowed 4,185 hits. That is amazing. He actually struck out more people than had a hit off of him. That is uh, amazing as a pitcher. And he's known as Roger the Rocket Clemens. And yet he uh, was on trial for lying to a congressional panel about taking performance-enhancing drugs. Uh, he was acquitted, but uh, most uh, people believe that he still used the drugs anyway. And there's, I think, things that have come out even since that trial uh, in that regard. But these men's desire for wealth and so-called greatness was obtained by trying to ensure victory in whatever sport it was. Their job was to be great, but they cheated and they did it the wrong way. Well, Christians, tonight we have a job to do and we don't have to cheat. We don't have to find gimmicks. We don't have to come up with tricks to win. We as Christians, listen, are guaranteed victory in Jesus Christ. We just simply need to follow God and His Word. And so I hope that I can be an encouragement to you tonight as we look at three things that God has showed me in His Word that we can have victory and know that it is sure. And so first off, uh, tonight we're going to work in reverse order and starting in verses 10 and 11 that Jesus Christ, number one, Jesus Christ laid the foundation. There in verses 10 and 11 it says this, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so we find that the most important piece of a building really is the foundation. You see, if the foundation is not done properly, then what is built on top of it will be weaker and less likely to stand for very long, if at all. And Jesus Christ taught this to the multitudes in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount uh, there in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And for three chapters in our Bible, he preaches to them about how those people should be living their lives. And in fact, in chapter 5 of Matthew, uh, Jesus tells them that they're the light of the world. He shows them how the law only changes the outside, but how they must instead look at the inside and what is coming out of their heart. And when it comes to things like killing and adultery and divorce and swearing an oath and revenge, suing and and loving your enemy. And, and then the law, uh, he reminds them that it dealt only with the outward actions, but Christ wanted them to know that God looks at the heart. In chapter 6, Jesus told them to give alms and pray humbly. He taught them how to pray to his Father. He tells them not to fast for men to see, but to do it so only the Father in heaven sees. He tells them to lay up treasures in heaven, and he teaches how they must serve one master, not two at the same time. Why? Because you can't serve two masters at the same time. And then in chapter 7, Jesus continues his sermon on the mount and teaches them about not being able to judge someone unless they have first judged their own life. He tells of the straight gate, the false prophets, and the fruit of men. And he then tells them everyone that, that says, Lord, Lord, will not be in heaven as I gave my testimony. That uh, Those three verses uh, really resonated with my life personally. And, and then he sums it up and ends his sermon with the story of who? The wise man and the foolish man. Oh, what do we, we, we learned that story at a very young age. We learned the song, The wise man built his house upon the rock. And we learned that song at a very early age, if you've been in church for any amount of time. And, and uh, the foolish man, we know that he builds his house upon the sand. And what happens? When the wind, the rain, and the floods come, his house falls. 
The wise man builds his house on a rock and it stands when the wind, rain, and floods came. And, and Jesus wants them to understand really that the whole message he just preached in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of our Bible won't do them any good unless they have built upon the right foundation. And so we have to understand that our works are worthless if they we're just doing them uh, because uh, we have, uh, we're trying to do them for work's sake. When our heart is unchanged, we are building upon the wrong foundation. And, and here Paul is trying to help this church to understand uh, that verse 11, uh, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so we find that Jesus laid the perfect foundation for everything that we need in our lives to serve him. And very importantly, uh, he points that out. Out because look at the following verses in 12 and following. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, notice what, he, notice what uh, Paul uh, writes about there. Six things, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Well, what are those six things often referred to as? Uh, or, or later on in the Bible, we find that, that gold, silver, and precious stones, those are the things that are going to remain for us as believers, uh, when we get to heaven one day and, and we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that is, uh, we are already saved and that's the reason you're there. You see, there's a very big difference. You understand the great white throne judgment is for the unbeliever. The judgment seat of Christ is for us believers, and it's not saying we're going to stand before Jesus and he's going to decide whether or not he's going to let us in heaven. No, the fact that you're at the judgment seat of Christ is proof enough that you are a, sa a saved uh, believer. And so you stand before Jesus, and, and what he does is he says, Now you accepted my son as your Savior. What did you do with all that I gave you from that point until this point? And he's going to judge us for our works, and we're going to receive gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. The difference between those six things, really there's two sets of three, the gold, silver, and precious stones are the good that we did for God, that we did well, with, with a pure heart, with a good conscience, with the right motives, will be rewarded in gold, silver, and precious stones. The things that we did for ourselves, the wood, hay, and stubble we find, in fact, look at verse 14. After verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, the day, speaking of the judgment seat of Christ, because it shall be revealed by fire, and what does fire burn? It burns wood, hay, and stubble. Gold, silver, and precious stones don't burn. In fact, if you were to take any of those things and put them in fire, it would purify them. And here we have that the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. That's the gold, silver, and the precious stones. That, those are the things that we did for God and not for self. But then in verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. Notice that? That's very important. Yet so as by fire. What is, what is Jesus saying there? What is Paul writing here in 1 Corinthians? That, that we need to understand that when we stand before that judgment seat of Christ, before Jesus at that moment, we as believers, we, we have already been saved. We're being judged simply for the things we've done. And I want to make such a, a great point of that in the sense of I want to keep plugging that away because we must understand that this is not the day, that day, of the judgment seat of Christ where we are judged whether or not we go to heaven or hell. That's so very important because uh, many people get caught up and they say, they say well, there it is, right there. That's, that, that proves that we have to work for our salvation. No. That all takes place after, remember, Jesus laid the foundation for salvation. That is, he did all of the work. And so when I accepted Christ as my Savior uh, some years ago, I didn't put my faith and trust on my foundation in doing the, all the good things that were going to get me to heaven. My foundation was the sand. My foundation was the foolish man. And when I tried to build that for 27 years as a religious person, what happened? Man, it didn't do anything good for me. When the wind and the, the rain and the storm came, uh, my religiousness, my religiosity, it was worthless. It was destroyed. But because God saved me, he put me upon the solid rock. He brought me up out of the miry clay and set me upon a rock. And, and that's the foundation that Jesus laid, that salvation is not by our works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And so when we look at this verse and these verses, we have to understand that Christ is judging us as believers for what we've done with what he gave us here in his word and uh, as the Holy Spirit has convicted our hearts and how we're supposed to live for him. And so we have the responsibility to build properly upon Christ's foundation. When you build on his foundation with his word, listen, church, Christian, you'll be able to stand. And we cannot take lightly the task of building upon the stone. You see, Christ has laid the foundation perfectly. 
And you must continue on striving to help build our church upon the rock, that is Jesus Christ, that is this church. And may you stand upon God's word in this evil, wicked, and foolish world because he's begun the work and we must be faithful in the work because we know he'll be faithful in completing what he has started. Listen, this church was built, I don't know, so many uh, years ago and, and there was a foundation that was built and everything that sits, that we really look at today is built upon the foundation. If the foundation was not built well, this building probably would not have lasted. I assume that you all get hurricane winds and such at times. I know we do in eastern North Carolina. I think you all are, are, far, are, are close enough away, uh, close enough to all of that where you'll get plenty of it. And so uh, if this foundation was not built properly, uh, I would suspect that you'd have major problems throughout uh, the building, especially on your exterior walls. Why? Because then you'll start having cracks. And you'll start having uh, maybe the corner of your foundation starts to sink in the ground some because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't maybe buried deep enough or it wasn't done properly. And, and uh, that cornerstone is very important because it, it holds uh, a, such a tremendous amount of, of weight uh, where those two walls come together. And, and I've seen buildings where, uh, man, it looked like a great building. And then you go to one corner and it's sagging and you see the bricks are, are disengaging from each other and starting to unlock because uh, the foundation that's under them cannot hold the weight and it was not built properly. But we as Christians don't have that problem. Amen. Jesus Christ laid the foundation perfectly. Matthew 21, 42 says, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That's also quoted in Mark 12, 10 and Luke 20, verse 17. And when we think about what Christ did for us, it's really marvelous work. Have you ever, have you ever looked at something that, that somebody built and you just think, Man, that is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's, that is gorgeous. I wish I could make something like that. I, I, have, uh, I have one brother that is an amazing woodworker. I mean, he can pretty much make anything you could possibly think of. And uh, when I see some of the things that he does, I just, I just think, wow. I mean, you did that? I, I just didn't, you know, you can't, it's so hard to imagine that a human can make something that amazing. And, and uh, we, we marvel many times at things that we as humans make, but the foundation that Christ laid is so marvelous, really words cannot even describe I mean, when we really think about what Christ did in, in our lives by saving us, by not making us work, think about this now. God, in His infinite wisdom, decided, I'm not going to make people work to get to my heaven. He said, I'm going to give it to you as a gift. Now think about that. And what, 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 is, what has happened in, in our culture, and in, in, let's just say humankind, mankind has tried every type of religion that has tried to say, listen, uh, the way you're going to get to heaven is by doing good things. Every religion, but the one that follows uh, God's word, has said, you're going to have to do something. And God's word says, I've already done it. All you have to do is believe. My son died for you. Believe on him. Put your faith and trust in Him. And know that the foundation has been laid perfectly. And when you build upon it, and you build upon it the way that I design, then, then the building that's going to come is going to be amazing. And really, if we do it God's way, people will see Christ and not us. As we've mentioned a number of times this week. You know, Christ even achieved His victory when He announced His Father on the cross, It is finished. You know why Christ could say that? Because he accomplished all the work that his father had sent him to do. It is finished. Isn't it a wonderful thing when a building project is done? You get to kind of just sit back and marvel and, and enjoy it. I remember helping my dad one time build an entertainment center uh, for us. This was back in the early to mid-90s. And uh, he bought this thing called a gateway destination computer. Any of you ever heard of that? It was like a 32-inch computer monitor, gigantic, okay? And it was a really powerful uh, computer. It was a whopping 500 megahertz. That's like nothing now, okay? And so this thing cost an absolute fortune. And so we knew we were getting this. And my dad said, I'm going to build this entertainment center for my, for my wife, for my mom. And so I remember helping him. And, man, we spent a lot of time. This thing was like six feet long. And it was about five feet plus tall, and he built it out of some really nice wood. I think it was oak. And I remember going out in the garage, and, and we get the plane around, and we plane down the wood, and we get the joiner out, and we joint, uh, joint those edges of the woods to get, wood together, and we'd, we'd glue them together, and then we'd sand off the, the glue, and we'd get everything looking just perfect. And, and then we started assembling the thing together, and 
Then my oldest brother, for some reason, he decided he wanted to get into uh, uh, wood carving. Uh, he was terrible at it, but anyway, he, he spent a fortune on these wood carving uh, 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 knives, and, and uh, so my dad used them to kind of make some, he carved out some hearts on this thing for my mom, and, and uh, you know, I look at them uh, when, now when I see a picture, I want sound like, <laughs> those were terrible, you know, but love covers a multitude of terribleness, doesn't it? And uh, so uh, I remember when we were working on that thing, it seemed like it was taking forever, and it was never going to happen. He built the doors for the, uh, the bottom section, and the cabinets and and that thing weighed so much and we finally got it finished and put it in the house and the computer came we put it in there and we just were able to stand back and just marvel really at how nice it looked it was like the biggest piece of furniture we lugged around for I don't know how many years after that but listen when we completed the task it was beautiful and that was, uh, you know, that wasn't even an amazing piece of furniture, but we think about some of the things that people make today, and man, we can just sit back and marvel. How much more did God the Father, after his son completed the work that he did, we know that God turned his back on his son. Father, uh, when he was hanging there on the cross, he uh, asked him, why have you forsaken me? And uh, we know that it was because of uh, our sins, yours and mine, that, uh, that Jesus was crucified there on the cross. But, but, then, but then, when Jesus did the work and he finished and completed everything that his Father sent him to do, you see, it was all part of the masterful plan of salvation. And, and God the Father, as he, as he received his Son uh, from the work that he did, listen, I believe there was... Uh, just some joy in God the Father's heart at His Son completing the work. And that's the foundation that we as believers have to build upon. Uh, Paul writes here and he says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, God's the wise master builder, he said, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so our wise master builder must be God Almighty and his plans for our life and everything that we ought to build are in this book right here. You, you know uh, the worst kind of contractor? The one that never looks at bull blueprints. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll just wing it. And your door's about three inches off the one side, and the windows don't actually match. You go outside, and you look at the front of the house, and nothing, is, uh, nothing just makes sense. And you're thinking, why in the world did that happen? Well, chances are somewhere along the way, somebody wasn't checking the blueprints. I've seen it a number of times. I've worked in enough uh, of uh, building different things and being a part of uh, being able to work in houses and different things. And uh, there was times I used to do, uh, I used to lay tile for a living uh, sometime after the Marine Corps. And, and uh, we'd go into houses and I would look at stuff and think, why is there that three inch gap right here? And there's this weird like section of something. I don't even understand what that is. You know what it was? Somebody uh, just didn't do something quite right. But God is the wise master builder, and when we follow his plans, listen, it will always come out the way he wants us to, Amen. if we follow his plans. He'll not make a mistake. He does not make a mistake. And so we have a perfect foundation uh, to work upon. Number two, we must work the fields. Look at verses 8 through 10. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according, listen, according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's buildings. We could even read it in verse 10, but we just did, so we'll uh, continue forward. And as we think about this idea of working the fields, listen, the Apostle Paul spent the first two chapters of this very book telling this church what they had in Christ. He warned them about the divisions they had been having over favorites and who was better. And he tells them in chapter 1, verse 18, about the preaching of the cross and what is its significance. In fact, that is one of my favorite verses uh, in Scripture. After I was saved, uh, that verse so uh, impassioned and burdened my heart that it just is uh, its just one of my favorites. In fact, if I ever sign something, sometimes kids will have me autograph their Bibles after I preach chapel, which I, I don't know why they do that. But uh, I just think, man, there's better people for that uh, to preach to sign a Bible, but 1 Corinthians 1.18 is what I put on there. Why? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. It's foolishness, the Bible says. Foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You know what? It wasn't man's wisdom that helped me realize that I need to be saved. It wasn't somebody that convinced me of something really special about God's Word. You know what it was? It was the preaching of the cross. Amen. 
The preaching of the cross, over and over and over again, year after year, week after week, month after month, that was convicting to me. And God promises in his word, what? That it'll never return void. He never promises that Jackie Elwert's word will not return void. You notice that in Isaiah? He says, my word will not return void unto me. You know what that means, believer? We have to work the fields and give God's word, not ours. My dad so uh, challenged me with this late in his life before he passed away. He said, Jackie, you know what? For so many years, he said, people would come and ask uh, how, we, how your mom and I would do this and how we would do that and raising kids and, and how we would do this and something, and something we did in the church. And, and for so many years, he's like, I would give them uh, just kind of how we did things. And he said, I, I would, I, he said, it wasn't that I gave them unbiblical advice. He said, I would give them the Bible and I would, and it was more of uh, in the principles that I spoke about. It was biblical principles, he said, but one day God convicted me uh, into realizing that, you know what, I'm giving a lot about what I think the Bible says about something instead of what God says about his own word. And he said, it, it really changed my life and my perspective that I need to be giving more scripture and let, let God deal with that person. Let them wrestle with God and not Dan's words. My dad's name was Dan. and Not, not uh, them wrestle with what I told them, but instead when I quote scripture to them, they have to deal with what God said and not me. Man, I, I really didn't really understand the, the significance. I knew what he was saying, but it wasn't until some years later that God began to work in my heart as I was ministering at our church and uh, doing the very same thing. Uh, you can ask a pastor. Uh, it's very simple for us many times to just give biblical principles that we know are true, and there's nothing wrong with that. But listen, our, our responsibility as believers is to give people God's word because that's what's going to cut to their heart. Amen. That's what's sharp and powerful uh, and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what's going to pierce uh, their heart and, 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 and just and, and cut it open to where it says, here's your problem. You know what convicted me of my need of salvation after being religious for 27 years? It was God's Word. That preacher preached Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I could not tell you one message that he preached. Now, I could go back, and I could get the messages, and I could listen to them, and I probably would remember some. But I can't, I'm telling you to this day, I don't know a message he preached. I don't know a passage he preached from. I don't know anything, but I know those three verses he quoted in that invitation. And you know what convicted me? Those three verses. God's Word. The preaching of the cross. What does it say? is to them that perish foolishness. You know what our world says? You all are a bunch of fools for being here tonight. That's what the world says. They wouldn't necessarily say it like that, although nowadays it's getting to be like they're actually saying that. But you know what? But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. You know why I'm here tonight? Because of God. You know why you're here tonight, I believe? Because of God. Amen. Yeah. I mean, God has changed our lives, but listen, we have to work the fields. Uh, he says in verse 8 that he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We're the same. You know, my pastor and our church weren't the ones that planted the seed of spiritual, uh, uh, of, of salvation, of uh, spiritual nature in the sense of, of the things that I was learning. They weren't the ones that planted the seed. That seed was planted long, long before that with my parents and a pastor of my church when I was growing up and, and other people all along the way. Listen, that seed was planted and it was watered for so many years. So many years. Until one day I came to that church. I'd only been there for a month. So my church and my pastor weren't even able to do much watering and planting of seed there. But you know what they were able to do? The rest of that verse. Or excuse me, uh, uh, verse number 6. Paul says, I've planted, Apollos watered, but what happened? God gave the increase. One day God gave the increase and my pastor and, and the folks there at our church were able to see uh, the work that had taken uh, all those years to come to fruition. How many of you, what, by raised hand tonight, were, were saved? You accepted Christ as your Savior the very first time you ever heard the gospel. Anybody? One, two, three, four. The second time? What? Or the first time? Four of you. This is the most I've ever seen in, in a church. Four out of however many folks are here. 30 maybe. You know what? That's, that's really the exception. And what I mean by that is most people the first time they hear the gospel don't accept it. Most people want to think about it. Most people, maybe they don't, they don't completely understand it. Maybe they don't get the full gospel. Maybe they just kind of get pieces of it, you know. And so we have to be careful that as believers, we don't just think, well, it's our job to plant it and then leave it. You know what happened for a farmer if he planted it and left it? 
<laughs> he wouldn't be a farmer very long, <laughs> would he? I mean, in eastern North Carolina, I've learned a lot about farming that I never learned being up in Michigan. I mean, I was, I was raised not too far from where Brother West was from, and, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of farmland. It was, uh, it was all made of concrete. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of farming. We had a, we had a little plot and a garden in the back of our yard. My parents always used to, to do stuff. But listen, one thing I learned in eastern North Carolina is that there is so much work that takes into bringing in the harvest. Many, many months before, it ever is, before that ever day ever comes. There's planting. There's watering, there's fertilizing, even before all of that there is tilling of the soil and then there is uh, aerating of the soil after the uh, crops are planted and maybe they start sprouting up some and they'll go through there with an aerator that'll just kind of flip the dirt over again and, and kind of bring some new life into it and, and then there has to be the perfect amount of rain at the perfect time and you know what the farmer can't do? He can't make rain. Now he can get sprinklers and he can artificially water, but listen, even that isn't as good as water from heaven. And so the farmer can do all he wants, but until God gives the increase, listen, he can do everything right as a farmer. But if God says that crop's not going to make it, guess what? It's not going to make it. I've seen it in eastern North Carolina, whether through hurricane, whether through over raining, too much rain and it floods out and, and it's worthless, or too much sun and there's not enough rain. And all those things are things that the farmer can't control. But you know what? The farmer's responsibility is not to control the weather. His responsibility is to plant and water, plant and water, plant and water. Church, believer, that's our responsibility. To work the fields. Plant and water. Plant and water. You see, the church seemed to be divided over what preacher was their favorite. And Paul tells them to knock it off. He says, just because, because they're just messengers. And in fact, he, he starts chapter 3 by telling them that. He says, you're carnal, you're babes in Christ. And he rebukes their squabblings and, and shares uh, his heart about how uh, he and uh, Apollos, even though different, were working toward the same goal. And one can do the planting, but someone's got to water. And even though these are both done, if God's not a part of it, it doesn't matter. You see, God must give the increase. Church, uh, your responsibility and mine is to constantly plant and water and pray that God will give the increase. You want to see this church grow beyond what it is at this very moment? Then your responsibility is to plant and to water and pray for God to give the increase. Because listen, you can do the work all day long, but if you're not asking God for help, then you're going to be doing it probably, I don't want to say in vain, because God can use His Word always, but I'm simply saying this. We ought to be doing it with the purpose and the goal that we can do all we can for God so that He'll be ready to work uh, when, the, when the harvest time is exactly where it needs to be. I'm so thankful for godly preachers that aren't concerned about who gets the credit. And what they're concerned about then instead is that the work gets done. And we must do the same. You can't be concerned about whether or not you'll be recognized in front of church or, or other people. The Bible says that's going to be your reward if that's your attitude. Instead, we should all be willing to work diligently everywhere we go, no matter who sees us or who finds out. You see, God knows, and He'll reward you accordingly in that day that's talked about in verses 13, 14, and 15. And the Bible tells us that, listen, God is going to take uh, care of that. And so I'm so thankful uh, for pastors that are concerned about that. I'm thankful for people uh, that are concerned about watering and, and planting and, and doing of that. You see, others have come into your church and they've planted and they've maybe gone on and others have come in and watered and, and maybe they've gone on and maybe you've been able to experience some of the reaping of the harvest. But listen, it's your responsibility to plant and water and let God give the increase. And when you do, you can celebrate. And many of you have done well, I'm sure of it, but we must do more. Why? The fields are wide under harvest. They're ready and waiting to be picked. And I'm convinced that, that people of our day and our society are ready to be picked. I believe the harvest is so white that people are so scared to die. I think that's number re reason number one why our, our world is so afraid of all that's going on right now. Now, I'm not saying if you wear a mask, you're a scaredy cat. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the, the hysteria that took place very early on, even into the, the following months that took place all over this world is because of one thing, mostly, that people were afraid to die. Listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to dying in the sense of like, I'm just like, hey, hey, yippee, let's go, let's go die. No, God gives all of us as human beings a will to live. What I'm saying is that he has given us desire to live, but, uh, but I don't have to be afraid of death. Why? Because as a believer, I know what's coming. Christian, can I encourage you with this thought that God shared with me some years ago, uh, sometime 
before my wife uh, passed away when she was uh, going through some of her uh, leukemia treatments and all things like that, you know what God uh, shared with me? It, it was this. That the worst thing that can ever happen to us as a believer is actually the best thing. I want you to think about that. The worst thing that could ever happen to you, what, here on earth, is what? Death. We fear it. And in a sense, uh, you know, I don't know how I'm going to die. I don't, I don't want to burn up in a fire. You know, get in a car wreck and then catch on fire and I can't get out and I burn up. I don't know. I don't want to die that way. I don't want to drown. You know, I hope it's really quick. That's what I, I hope. But it doesn't really matter, does it, in the end? We, and so we think about death, and we're, we're, we may be afraid of how we're going to die, but as believers, listen, however we leave this world, it's only going to take us to the best thing of our existence. I mean, that's what we have to look forward to. And so I don't have to be afraid of, of uh, coronavirus. Yes, I'll take precautions, but I don't have to be afraid of that. I don't have to be afraid of civil war. Yes, I'm going to take precautions. And I'm going to do everything I can to, to, to see our country not go through that. I, I'm, I'm not going to be afraid of this or that or this or that. Whatever it is, we're going to do all we can to try to make sure that uh, we are able to live as long as we can. But listen, I don't have to fear death because I know the one that holds my hand and my life in his hand. Amen. The Bible is very clear that if you're saved, that Jesus says that uh, uh, I have you in my hand, my Father has you in my hand, and the Holy Spirit, we find out later on in the New Testament, uh, seals us under the day of redemption. We have triple security salvation. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, are holding us and sealing us, and we cannot lose our salvation. I'm thankful for that. Amen. I'm thankful that I know that if I drop dead at this very moment, I will be with the Lord. The abs to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so as soon as I leave this body, I've gone to the best thing of my entire existence. You know what's scary for the unbeliever? Right now is the best of their existence. This is the best they have to look forward to. They may say they're going to have a party in hell, but they know that there's not, not going to be that. Listen, you know why? Romans 1 tells us that God has written his law upon their hearts, and he has written, I believe, the understanding and fact that they're going to have to pay for their sins in a place called hell. Whether they want to believe it or not, it's there. Listen, you could say you don't believe in atomic energy tonight just because you don't understand it or you don't want to believe in it, but I can tell you it's real. You know why? Because it's been proven. <laughs> you can see it. You can see the effects of it in certain places in the world. You, could, you can watch the video of it. And I don't understand all that atomic energy is, and I couldn't tell you how that it actually happens, but I can tell you this. It's real. I don't understand all of hell, but I know it's real. Jesus spoke more of it than he did about heaven. And it's a very real place, and so we must work the fields. Lastly tonight, God will finish it all. Listen, victory is sure, church. Victory is sure. That is such a wonderful truth. And so as we look at verses 6 and 7, I have planted, Paul says, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. You see, God's going to finish it all. Our job is to, to plant and water, but God's going to give the increase. He'll reward your labors, and He'll work in the lives of men and women through His Holy Spirit, and He knows exactly what each one of us needs in our lives. And I'm so thankful that God is able to do what I cannot. You see, I cannot make someone get saved, but God can convict their hearts. And he can use his, his Holy Spirit, can draw them unto Himself, and His Word can pierce their hearts because we know, as mentioned earlier, it's sharper than any two edged sword. You see, His Word is what will show people their need of salvation because it's the preaching of the cross that is the power of God, not my words or yours. And so we must build upon the right foundation. We must work the fields, and then we get to see the victory of it all. You see, God is going to finish it all, and He's the one who's going to work behind the scenes in the life of that person who just can't seem to make a decision to serve the Lord the way you know they can. We, we must simply plant and water. We must pray and encourage. We must teach and preach, and God will work in their hearts because His timing is always right on time, and He wants us to be faithful, and He'll take care of the harvest in the sense of He will bring forth uh, the fruit. He will bring forth the increase. We have to be ready to do the planting and the watering and to bring in uh, the, uh, the fruits. And You know, I was amazed as I began to read through Revelation one time. I came across a verse that never really stuck out to me before. If you want to hold your place here and turn to Revelation 21, 6. We're pretty much going to uh, be done there in 1 Corinthians, but 
I want to read a verse here in Revelation chapter number 21 and verse number 6 as, we, as I bring the message to a close over these next moments uh, tonight. Revelation 21 and verse 6. And as I was reading through Revelation, uh, it's just one of my favorite books to read in, in just in all at one time. Because there's just so much there, and, and it just seems like you always, re, you always learn so much as you do so. And wow, what a day that would be to, to be able to experience some of these things that we read about in Revelation. But here in verse number 6, I, I saw something amazing I never, never caught me before. It says this, Revelation 21 verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. You know what? Uh, when I saw that phrase, it is done. It really hit me, and I wondered if that was the same word that Christ said on the cross when he said, it's finished. I thought, man, wouldn't that be something? If this phrase, it is done, is the same as what Jesus said, it is finished. So I began to research. And sadly, I was a little bit discouraged to find out it wasn't the same. <laughs> but as I began to study it, listen, I found out that it was actually better. The word finish or finished occurs 21 times in our New Testament. And they're all in different forms of the Greek word teleo. It means to bring to an end or complete or fulfill. And, and that was the, the term that Jesus used. It is finished. It is completed. It is fulfilled. I have done the work. And so we have, as I began studying these times of the word finish or finished occurred, it was interesting to find that they all pretty much meant the same thing. And they all meant to complete or complete fully or to bring to an end. In fact, I'll give you a few of them. John 4.34 says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To complete his work. John 5, 36. But I have a greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher or completer of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In John 17, 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. That was when Jesus was praying that prayer in John 17, which is an awesome one. And if you ever get time to study it, oh man, you'll be excited by the time you get done. And don't forget, put your name in all those words there, but you'll, that's for another time. John 74, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He completed the work. John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is completed. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You see, this finishing marked by the highest quality. It was consummate. It was complete in every detail. It was perfect and of the highest degree. That is the finished workmanship of Christ. And when God finishes something, it's perfect. It's done with flawless precision. And this was the finishing that Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And then I found out that only one time does the word finish come from a different Greek word. It, it, it's ginomai. And it occurs in Hebrews 4.3. It means to come into being or to happen or to become. For which we, in Hebrews 4.3, for we, we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the word were finished, or although the works were to happen from the foundation of the world, or to come into being. You see, that was in the past. It has become. It was to arrive in due course. But in Revelation 12.10, uh, is a, sim a similar word. He says, and now has come salvation and, and strength. And that term, now has come, is, is similar to the phrase that uh, it is finished. And then, in Revelation 21.6, that this word, it is done, it really means is come. And he said unto me, it is done, or it is come. God's plan, the Bible tells us, has become, it has arrived in due time. And just like Christ arrived when the fullness of time had come, the new Jerusalem, in this passage of Revelation chapter 21, arrives. And the Bible tells us that tears are wiped away, and there's no more death, and it is done. It has become, it has happened like God has planned. And man, when God gives the final, it is done. He's saying not only has he accomplished the work, but it will come into being. It's going to happen. It's going to become. It is as good as done. That is the God we serve tonight. That is the God we have the privilege of serving and telling others about. Church, listen, we can plant and water, but God must give the increase. You see, he promises that his word will not return void in Isaiah 55, 11. Let me read it. So shall my word be, the, be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Listen, that goes for everything that God says. 
Everything that he has said will not return void. You know what it means? Not, it's not empty words. His promises are not empty. We have a God whose promises are sure. We have a sure hope of heaven. We have a sure home in heaven. And we don't have to wonder if we're going to be there one day. We can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And because our God is not a liar, man, we've got something to be excited about. Victory is sure. We don't have to wonder. I'm so thankful for that, that when I get to the end of my life, no matter when it is, and if I have a, 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 a deathbed uh, a time where I'm laying there on my deathbed and I get to gather around all my children and grandchildren and whoever is there at that time, whenever it is, and I'm laying there and, and, I, and we know the end is near, and if I get that opportunity, listen, I have the opportunity to lay there and be a reminiscent of all the times that God was so good and that the days ahead are only going to be better than everything behind. Amen. Why? Because he's done all the work to get me to heaven. And my life from that point backwards to my salvation was not because of me. It was all because of him. And when I look to that time, when I get to be in heaven with him, it's because of him and not me. And I know that because of his promises, I'll stand before him one day in a place called heaven. What a wonderful promise. Church, believer, tonight, just keep preaching the Word. Just keep telling others about the Word and the God of the Word. You see, He'll do the changing. He'll give the increase. We must simply plant and water. Plant and water. Plant and water. The Bible says if we sow sparingly, sparingly, we'll reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. So let's sow uh, bountifully. Let's sow so much seed across uh, this part of South Carolina, across eastern you know, North uh, United States, across our country, that the harvest overflows uh, to states and countries and the world for Christ. Listen, our job is to, is to uh, continue doing the work. And so can I encourage you, believer, tonight, don't lose heart. There's hope. There is a sure hope. And keep on telling others about the Savior of this world. Keep building upon the perfect foundation that Christ laid. Jesus told His Father it is finished on the cross. And with that, He laid the foundation. And just keep working the field. God's going to give the increase. Keep on keeping on so we can, like the Apostle Paul say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Believer, keep preaching the word because we know that victory is sure. It is become. It is done. God will say in the end that I have accomplished all my work. You see, he's promised the victory and so let us be faithful. Let us be working. As Philippians 1, 6, 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You see, God started the work. He'll help us with the work and he will finish the work and he'll say, it is done. Father, thank you for the promises of your word. Lord, I'm, I'm so excited as I think about the victory and how we have it. Lord, I don't have to cheat. I don't have to, I don't have to do uh, things to try to uh, manufacture victory. Lord, we as believers know that victory is sure. So God, would you help us to, to remain faithful? Would you help us to, to do the work? Lord, we know that you're going to one day say it is done. As your son said, it is finished on the cross uh, there at Calvary, saying he completed the work of salvation. And one day, uh, you're going to declare that you have done everything that you said you're going to do. And you'll wipe away the tears from our eyes, and there will be no more sin. Oh, Father, I can't wait for that day. But Lord, you're not here yet. You haven't taken us back home, so there's obviously uh, more work that needs to be done. And so, God, would you help each of us here tonight or watching on the live stream that are believers that we would be faithful until you call us home or until you come and, and, uh, and uh, whether you take us through the grave or in the clouds. Lord, I thank you that you have laid the perfect foundation upon which we can build our lives upon and we can share uh, your gospel to those around us and they can build their lives upon the perfect foundation. And, and Father, I'm thankful that you simply uh, want us as believers to plant and water and we know that you're the one that gives the increase. And so, Father, help us to have that mindset tonight. Lord, if there's anybody that's listening to the sound of my voice tonight that does not know your Son as their Savior, Lord, these are the best days they'll ever have if they don't accept Christ. And so I pray that you'd help them to realize their need of Him. Lord, you've done all the work. You have, you have done everything for them to be saved. Would you help them to realize and put away their pride and humble themselves and accept your Son as their Savior? Lord, would you help them tonight? As believers, Lord, we need your help. 
Help us to do your work. And remember always that victory is sure. So we must finish, and we must finish the race that you've called us to do. For it's in Christ's name we ask. Amen. With every head bowed and eyes closed tonight as the piano plays, would you just stand to your feet with your head bowed and eyes closed? And I don't know what your need is tonight, but whatever it is. Listen, I, the messages that were preached this week, I hope uh, as they progressed were a help to you in the sense that they reminded you that uh, what God has done in your heart through saving you, what God has done in your heart and, and, and uh, uh, throughout your life and that we'll remember as believers always that uh, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. Believer, would you just uh, ask God to help you to finish well, to continue building upon the foundation that He so perfectly laid? Would you, would you commit to God uh, that you'll do the planting and the watering that He desires you to do and, and allow Him to give the increase? If you're here tonight or watching online and don't know Christ, would you come forward or maybe send Pastor or uh, Miss Sarah a, a message and ask them and they would love to show you from God's Word how you can be saved. Oh, Christian, we have so much to be excited for. If you've never won anything in your whole life, listen, you are at least guaranteed one victory and it's the best one. I can't wait for that day. But I pray that God would give me a desire to see so many more people come so that they can see and experience the victory in their lives that I've been able to experience. Listen, God's work and God's Word is what we need to concentrate on in our lives. We must be a people that desire our lives to be something that God wants. They ought to be that our desire is to see others come to Christ. And so if you need to uh, talk with God some more, please do. Some have come. And we'll take some more time, as much time as needed tonight. You pray. Ask God to help you. And He will. Maybe you need to pray for God to give you compassion as we spoke about a little bit. I believe it was Sunday. God, you, I need compassion for the lost. Listen, our God is a good God and the Bible tells us in the Gospels that Jesus said, if you're a good father here on this earth, how much more would your heavenly father want to give you good gifts? And so when you ask God for something that he wants, listen, he's going to give it to you. I'm convinced of that. He he says in his word, if we ask something that is biblically uh, God's will, he promises he'll do it. If you ask him for wisdom, I believe he'll give it to you. James talks about that. If you ask God for strength and courage to tell somebody about Christ, I believe he'll give you courage and strength. Maybe we just need more boldness as believers tonight to tell others about Christ. Ask God for that. If maybe that's your issue. God, would you please give me boldness? I want to be a better witness for you. And start somewhere. Start tomorrow. Start tonight. And God will help you.
There's nothing more precious in the world than a heart that's sensitive to God. and That's what we need. More sensitivity. More yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. More trusting in God's Word. And we make it so difficult as older adults, you know, it's and Jesus tells us to come before Him as just little children. Just trusting Him as my son would trust me, and sometimes he probably trusts me a little too much, but uh, that's what He desires from us. It's a blessing to hear how much God will help us and how much God is going to finish the work. And that's a joy, that's an excitement, that's a... That's a praise, and He tells us if He's listening to the message, we ought to pray for that. Pray for revival. Pray for strength. Pray that God would help us to do the work. He wants to do it through us, but we must be yielded to Him. And I want that to be our prayer tonight as we close in a word of prayer. Lord, You do the work. Lord, You build Your church. Lord, help our hearts to be sensitive to You that we would hear when You direct our path and You would show us plainly and clearly what we ought to do. Brother Ed, would you close us out in a word of prayer?